All right, everybody, we are live. Welcome to Lightning Round with Laura. I am your host, Laura Reeves from the Pure Dog Talk podcast. Those of you who are unfamiliar with the podcast, we have over 500 episodes. We talk to the legends of the sport and we give you tips and tools to have a better life with your pure, pure, purebred dog. So very, very excited to be starting these live podcasts this year, 2022 debut lightning round with Laura. We had one last month. We had a special guest drop by then. We have another special guest who's going to drop by tonight. So I'm very excited, you guys. This is an ask me anything opportunity. So live chats there for you. And we will have lots and lots of good conversation. One of the things that we wanted to talk about this month was mentoring. We just had a, a conversation about this on our Pure Dog Talk patrons group. And so for those of you who are not members of the patrons group, this is an amazing opportunity. Unbelievable community. Um, this is a sort of the NPR of dogdom, right? So you have the opportunity to support the inner workings of the podcast and for as little donation, whatever you want to make, 5, 10, 20, whatever you can do each month, you get to be a member of the patrons Facebook group. And this group of people has developed into an extraordinary community. And we have the after dark once a month where we sit around and talk dogs and have a little adult beverage. It's great fun. So you're welcome. You can find the become a patron button on the puredogtalk.com website whenever you want to find it. Always remember to support our sponsors. Trupanion and Embark are huge, huge advocates for our work in as dog breeders and in purebred dogs. And so I think it's really important that we remember who makes it so we can do some of the fun stuff, right? And we support them in return for their support of us. Okay. Your passion is our purpose. Are you ready? All right, let's go. So mentoring. Mentoring is something that people talk about a lot. Um, and, oh, hey, hang on just half a second. Welcome to Lightning Round with Laura. Who's on the call today? Oh, this is Marty Greer. Oh, you guys. I told you we had a really cool guest. Dr. Marty Greer, who um, anyone who has listened to a Pure Dog Talk podcast in the last uh, five years has heard Dr. Marty Greer's veterinary voice column, if you will, her, her standing monthly um, conversation with us about really, truly incredible information made available by one of the top veterinarians in the country to every one of our listeners. So Marty, welcome to Lightning Round. How are you doing? This is so fun. I'm be here. Thank Isn't you. it great? I love it. Hi, I we have um, guest audience people dropping in and typing in the live chat, Marty. So I will, I, you can't see that, but I can. So I'll share that with you as we go. <clears throat> yes, Stacy. We have Dr. Greer, Annette, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I'm so glad that you enjoy the podcast. And I cannot tell you how many notes and messages and emails and all kinds of things I get from people that tell me that literally um, Marty Greer's podcast on X, Y, or Z topics saved their dog's life. So we are super lucky and I appreciate your time, Marty. And hi, hi, everybody. Yay. Oh my gosh, Marty, you're talking on the phone and in the live chat. Damn, you are like, <laughs> you are absolutely the multitasking queen. I love it. Okay, you guys. So yeah. if you've got questions for, for Marty or for me, shh, pop them in the, in the chat. Meanwhile, Marty, talk to us a little bit about your thoughts about mentoring and how you were mentored as a baby veterinarian and how you help mentor other baby veterinarians in your practice. Oh, wow. That's a great question. 
Um, I love mentoring the baby veterinarians, um, and it's been really fun. We've been very fortunate that over the last few years in particular, that the theriogenology uh, department at many of the veterinary schools are sending students, veterinary students to it. Awesome. So that's been a real class. Um, Missouri loves us. Minnesota sends us students. Auburn sends us students. Do your practice in Wisconsin, practice. right? Yeah. Nice. I get them for two to four weeks. And it's it's really been a blast. Um, Love it. Because they do as much for us as we do for them. They mm -hmm. come in with fresh ideas and fresh faces mm -hmm. and, you know, all the stuff that they've been taught. And then we... I, I tend to assign homework every day. I give them at least one homework assignment and we challenge them a little bit. And it's just been really fun to have these students. Um, they, they really, they really bring a new perspective to the practice. I think they do every bit as much for me as, uh, and the practices we do for them. So it's, it's fun and it's exciting. And so if any of you have veterinary students or even students that are thinking about veterinary medicine, they're welcome to come and stay with us. I have a place for them to sleep and stay, and I have to pay for hotel rooms. Um, they have to get here and get back, but gosh, otherwise I'd love to have them. You know what, Marty? I think I want to pick up on something you just said, because I think it's actually when we talk about mentoring, no matter what, no matter what area, whether it's veterinary medicine or dog training or dog handling or dog breeding or what have you, the mentoring relationship is a street, right? Like I help teach someone how to show their dog or present their dog better. And they help me learn something about their breed or about their dog, or I learn a trick from what worked and what didn't with that dog. Right. 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 Absolutely. They bring a fresh, a fresh perspective and they look at things with, with new eyes and mm -hmm. we're like, Oh, you know what? We never thought about it that way before. So it's been really fun, but I also make them do things that they're like, they think it's kind of stodgy. And I say, okay, so I want you to do this tonight. I want you to go home and I want you to start a spreadsheet. And they go, okay. And I say, I want you to put on the spreadsheet all the procedures that you've seen, done, or been a participant in. Because a year from now, five years from now, you're going to have someone that looks at you and says, well, how many of these have you done? And you can pull up your spreadsheet. If you keep it current, you can pull mm -hmm. up your spreadsheet and say, well, I've done 362 C-sections. And mark my words, people are going to go, oh, oh. Okay. So you know what you're doing. Go do it. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, well, I'm not sure. Now, right. I started practicing in 1981. There were no computers. There were no spreadsheets. We did have notebooks, so I could have <laughs> written it down. But it never occurred to me, no one ever pointed out to me this hopelessly obvious bit of information. So um, so after I've been in practice 27 years, so this was 14 years ago, I had a client in my practice, and I said to her in the exam room, she was an Airedale breeder, she had an Airedale that I thought needed a C-section, and I said to her, your dog needs to go to surgery, she needs a C-section, and she needs it now. And she kind of screws up her face, and she stands up, and she's nose to nose with me, and she says, how long you been doing this? And I said, 27 years. And she said, no, 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 no. How long you been doing this? And I said, ma'am, 27 years. And she says, okay, fine. Do the C-section. <laughs> well, we saved all the puppies. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, yes. We do that a lot. But unless you have that spreadsheet, so this goes for any, this isn't just veterinary. This is mm -hmm. anything you guys do. Whether it's litter evaluations mm -hmm. or championships or litter the puppies, start keeping track of it because it's so valuable to yes. go back. And and it goes back to, you know, every time you have a litter of puppies, take take photographs of them the day they're born. Yes. Do all four views, front, back, each side. Do it every two weeks. Keep track of it. Just keep track of this stuff. And you're going to have oodles and oodles of pictures. So put a photo, you know, put a, put a card on the photo of, of you know, yellow girl, right. who and who and what day it was, blah, blah, blah. It's easy to do. But gosh, you know, that kind of data is unbelievably valuable when you start going backwards in time. Right. And what I think of is the pictures that I've taken over the years, right, at 25 years of breeding this particular line. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You have that in the corgis. 
And, and so I have my stacked pictures at six and eight weeks and I can look at those and I know what that dog turned into, right? I know how it turned out. It was number one or it was somebody's lovely pet, <laughs> right? And, and I can exactly. say, here's this puppy at the same age with this same basic pedigree. And this is what it looks like. It's either going to be, you know, very successful or somebody's lovely pet. But you have that background knowledge and understanding that I think is absolutely in, invaluable. Yeah. So you can't take too many pictures. You can't take too many notes. You can't have too many spreadsheets or notebooks or whatever mm -hmm. you want to keep a track of. Mm -hmm. Now, I have one client, and this was probably 10 or 11 years ago we did this. She had a C-section and there was a single male puppy in the litter. And we got finished with the C-section and I went out to do my evaluation of the puppy to make sure his heart sounded okay and he didn't have a cleft palate and all this stuff and so i stacked him on the table the exam table and she grabbed her phone and she took a picture and she posted it on facebook and within seconds a friend of hers in sweden had seen the picture and facebook messaged her back that puppy went on to win the national wow in his breed wow two years of age so i now charge extra just so you know i charge <laughs> extra for my c-sections where i stack your puppies at one hour of age no you um, don't because, <laughs> yes i do no i don't you're right i don't it, but it's really it's really funny but you'd be surprised what you learn from looking back at those pictures mm -hmm. so yes we really did stack it and yes she really did put it on facebook and yes he really did win the national i'm mm -hmm. not joking about that at two years of age that dog really won the national i know exactly who it is and if i said his name a lot of people on the call would know who he is yep but i'm not going to do that but just Remember that, I mean, that's the story that I want you to carry around in your head the next time you have a litter of puppies is, yeah, Dr. Greer said to do this, and this is why, because you're going to find that information to be unbelievable. And and this is actually a, an idea that I stole from Carmen Battaglia, mm. and that's to have your puppy party when the puppies are a year old, have a puppy party. Um, and it doesn't have to just be a litter of puppies. Invite all your people back with their puppies. Have it at some place that you can have dogs that, you know, they can have a big area to roam around in, whether it's indoors or outdoors. Someplace fenced, of course, if it's outdoors. And look at your puppy. So you're not just getting a Christmas card from them with a picture of a headshot in, in the family portrait. But see their temperament and see how they move and all of those things. See how that coat really turned out. What did that mouth do, right? Exactly. And you would be stunned at how valuable that information is. I still have a picture of my daughter's Bernie's Mountain Dog litter that's 20 years ago. And it's so cool to look back at that picture and see all of the puppies all together at one year of age, all on their birthday. Oh and it's gosh. just, it, you know, it doesn't cost you anything to buy some brats and some buns and some chips and have a little party. It's just, it's so important that you keep track of this information. And then have somebody at the puppy party that's got a camera that's just taking pictures all mm -hmm. over the place because mm -hmm. you're going to be chatting with all the people that are right. there. And you're not going to be focused on taking photos and taking videos. But have a, a friend that's willing to just grab their phone and videotape this stuff, photograph this stuff. It's unbelievably valuable. So this has nothing to do with veterinary care and everything to do with just general dog information. Being a dog breeder. And, and here's the thing about it, Marty. You bring invaluable experience as a dog breeder as well as as a veterinarian, which is why you make a particularly good veterinarian. Um, I will... I will say I have not done the, you know, regather the clan as adults. I've always wished I could, but so many times those puppies are all over, you know, all over hell and creation. You can't get them back. Right. But I love to go to national specialties and encourage even the pet people that happen to live nearby. Right. Because the, the national travels around in most instances, in most breeds, not all of them. But it moves east, midwest, west like that. And try and bring even your pet people to the national so you can see those puppies, see them grown up. They can see, you know, the national events. They can learn more about the breed. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, here's a little, um, little bit of secret information as well. Is four years ago, we went to the Otterhound National because the Otter Hounds petitioned the AKC and asked if the Otter Hound Club could start a semen bank, collecting semen and storing and maintaining and using semen on pet dogs that were owned in just family homes and 
have the Otter Hound Club own that semen, and the AKC said remarkably and with wisely, yes, you can. Well, that has now evolved. I will say Joel and Gregory um, yes. is a veterinarian in Sandy Olney, uh, Maryland, and one of my clients, Becky um, Van Houten, mm-hmm. kind of had this as a brainchild. Mm-hmm. And they have evolved into, yes, we did that. So pet dogs from, we were in Iowa for that show. So pet dogs from the Midwest came to the show. Mm-hmm. We collected semen on them and we froze it and mm-hmm. it's stored at Iowa State University. So mm-hmm. we have access to the semen for future generations. And the AKC, two years ago at the parent club meeting, I grabbed Mark Dunn by the ear and drug him to a table and said, Mark, we have to sit down and have a conversation. He's like, okay, join me at dinner. So we sat down and I said, we need to put together a toolkit for all breeds to be able to do what the Otterhound Club has done. Because the Otterhound people are, they know they're in trouble genetically. Mm -hmm. They have a small gene pool, but even Labradors and Golden Retrievers have limitations on their gene pools. Dobermans, any of these breeds, we all have it, right? We all do. We all do. And we, you know, Skipper Keys had a bottleneck and they ended up with MPS3. I mean, there's mm-hmm. all these things that happen in our mm-hmm. breeds. Nobody means for it to happen. But if we're not more forward thinking about how we save our semen and how we manage our, our pet dogs, mm-hmm. now, you know, just because he's a pet doesn't mean he's not valuable, either in right. the gene pool for genetically using him as his semen or for his DNA later on to be tested when additional DNA tests become available. Mm-hmm. There's so much that we can do. So AKC has brilliantly and in their wisdom and forward thinking because Mark Dunn is forward thinking about this has allowed other breeds to do this. Now it's not completely ready to roll out. The the parent club meetings have been held and we're working on the committee with Joel and Dr. Gregory and Mark Dunn and a bunch of other people. And we've worked really hard to put together a toolkit so that every breed doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. We can make this easier, but we're pushing back the age at which we neuter dogs at this point. You know, it's smart to let them become mature. So this is a chance to say, okay, he's going to grow up. He's going to mature. We're going to collect his semen and then we're going to neuter him. Right. But his semen is now in a semen bank. So we can come back to it and use it down the road. If we end up with a bottleneck or a genetic mutation or some other disaster, World War Three, right. you know, like World War One and World War Two caused serious bottlenecks in right. The European Huge. Dogs. We didn't have those genes. So we have to be smart about how we do this. Now, World War Three could be the end of the world, but if it's not, I still want to own a dog. Right. Well, Marty, a couple of things that, um, and everybody knows my, my saying on this one, there's a podcast for that. There is a podcast for that. We did interview <laughs> Joe Ellen way back. Um, and she is phenomenal. And I think one of the things that's really super amazing about this is that as the um, other clubs are able to do it and and follow the Otter Hounds uh, guidelines, the the semen isn't just available to you, right? Like you own the dog, you're the only one that can use it is the way the world works today. In this vision, that semen is available to anyone. That's yes, huge. it is. And there are people in breeds, certain breeds that are reluctant, shall we say, reticent to share their semen with other people mm-hmm. because they're like, this is my dog. I've spent 40 years developing this line of dogs and it's mine. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a little bit narrow minded and a little short sighted. Mm-hmm. So I think that it's really important that we are more global. And even if you don't want your dog to be used in the gene pool, at least his semen will be there for DNA testing down the road when additional DNA tests become available. And newsflash people, some of the DNA tests that we're banking heavily on that we are relying and and eliminating dogs from our gene pool, some of the tests are going to prove to be wrong, folks. So really be smart about what you do. And you don't have to wait until the dog is four years old to start collecting the semen. Their semen is best between two and five years of age. Don't wait until he's 12. Don't wait until he has cancer. Don't wait until he's sick. Don't wait until he falls in the swimming pool and drowns. Don't wait for, Don't wait until he gets kicked by a deer, hit by a car, whatever you want it to imagine. Collect his semen when he's young. You know, you can look at these dogs. You know when they're a good dog or not a good dog. Mm-hmm. Collect the semen. Now they're frozen. You can always thaw it out later. But AKC is really, really, really working hard to make this a very cool program. And... I, I, I have a very strong saying, you have yours, I have mine. 
People don't look like their dogs. They act like their dogs. So terrier people we know are terriers, yes. and corgi people are corgis, yes. and herding people are herding people, and golden retriever people are golden retriever mm-hmm. people, and that's the way it is. So people have a lot of personality traits that match those of their dogs, mm-hmm. but we need to be global, we need to be smart about this, and we need to not be selfish about our genetics. If you've worked 40 yes. years to develop a really great line of dogs, share it, share it. It doesn't mean it's going to be irresponsibly used share it. And we just had a comment from Stacy actually, and she's dead on. She says that she thinks some of our best in her breed, which are Spinoni, are sitting in a backyard or out hunting in the field and never made it to the ring. And, and that's absolutely correct. It's correct in wire hair pointers. It's correct in a lot of our sort of bird dogs, you know what I'm saying? Or maybe they, maybe they finished it and, and went home and nobody's ever seen it. Yeah. Right. And it's gorgeous. And you're like, wait, what? Uh, that dog. Right. Right. And, you know, we've all sold beautiful pet dogs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't have the the number of show homes we need. Mm -hmm. And frankly, sometimes show homes aren't the best homes for the dog. Sometimes either before they're shown, during while they're being shown or after they're shown, the best home is someplace where they are someone's one and only Mm -hmm. love of their life. Mm hangs with the kids, doesn't get stuck in a crate or a kennel or a, whatever. We all know that is the case, that mm-hmm. sometimes the pet homes are the best homes for that dog. And we need to be forward thinking and not selfish about this. Because if you really value the, the breed you have devoted your life to, share their semen. Share There's the love. Kind of off track here. It's okay. But, but this is mentoring. So this <laughs> This is mentoring too, Marty. <laughs> it is. It is. And I'm sorry to kind of hijack the conversation. No, you're good. This is so important. That's why I brought you here. Hijacking. I'm all about it. So, okay. So that's, I think that that's a really important thing. And I think it's something, you know, obviously Marty's invested time in it. If you guys haven't heard it, go back and listen to Joelle and Gregory's podcast that we did several years ago. <clears throat> I think right after she had gotten this done. And, um, and, and really take a listen to that. Cause it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, I wanted to touch on another subject, Marty, where, where I can combine your, um, and some of you guys don't, um, don't realize that Marty is not only a DVM, she is also an attorney. And so every now and then I pick Marty's brain on legal plus veterinary stuff. And so it being lightning round, I thought we'd touch on a hot topic that just popped up uh, yesterday when the courts in Norway made it illegal to breed bulldogs or Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. And for those of you who have not heard of this or think this is crazy, understand that it's coming here. Um, So Marty, I wondered if you wanted to uh, touch on that for a minute. Well, yeah, I've been following this. I'm on the IPFD board because I'm on everybody's board Mm -hmm. at some point. Um, So they have, and I'll I'll send you the link for this. Um, It's Dog Wellnet. Right. So if you're not familiar with Dog Wellnet um, and the Harmonization Project, take a look at that. Because there's some really cool stuff on there about DNA testing and genetics and how we need to use this. And this is a pretty controversial and difficult topic right now, but you're right. Everything that happens in Europe eventually ends up happening here. They just tend to be a little bit ahead of us about certain things. Um, and maybe it won't. The Americans, Americans as a whole, and genetically, so we get back to genetics. <laughs> genetically, our forefathers left the European countries or whatever country that your family comes from. And so whether it's Oriental country, countries or European countries or South America, whatever you came from. Your family, in your genetically, uh, genetic line, left their country and made it to the United States and said, I want to live in the U.S. because I am going to have better freedom in the U.S. than I have in my other country. So we inherently as Americans, I believe, genetically are rebellious and less likely to fall in line behind what everybody else does, which I think is a great thing. But we are seeing tail docs. And ear crops go away. We're seeing declaws go away. 
we're seeing a lot of things really change in how things are done. Um, I had a conversation today with a client about decline um, cats, and you can feel the way you feel about it, but there are some clients that can over the cat unless it's declawed because they have immune-mediated diseases, they're immunocompromised, and if the cat claws them, they can't keep the cat. And so, you know, if you have AIDS or rheumatoid arthritis or cancer and you can't have a cat because of that, it's a, it's a big deal. So all of this is a big deal because we are eventually going to deal with limitations that are put on us by people that aren't us. We've already seen pet stores go away, like it or not. We've seen pet stores go away. We've seen kennels decrease in size. We've seen people put out of business that really shouldn't be put out of business because they thought that they were horrible people that are breeders. And all of you on this call are probably a breeder. So in someone's mind, you're an evil, horrible person because you breed dogs. So we have to realize that this stuff is coming. And we have to be really careful with how we fall in line and what we allow our government, our breed clubs, our whatever tell us to do. So it is a difficult problem. Yes, this is very controversial. And there are people on the IPFD board from all over the country, some in the U.S., some in Canada, some from the European countries. Um, a lot of them are from the um, Swedish, Danish, that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tough conversation. And we're going to see limitations put on brachycephalics. We, you know, if you if you don't crop ears on a Doberman, I know that sounds like a different topic, but it's not. If you don't crop ears on a Doberman, same. it doesn't look like a Doberman. It looks like a black and tan coonhound. Um, <clears throat> Great Danes look like Great Danes. Boxers look like boxers, but Dobermans look like black and tan coonhounds if they're not cropped and docked. Or really um, bad lab crosses. Really, yeah. Um, people love their Frenchies. They love their Bulldogs. They're cool little dogs, but we're going to have to be really careful what we wish for because this is going to come down and we're going to end up not getting to pick some of the things that we really want to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's something that we just all need to be aware of. Um, you'll probably have heard about National Animal Interest Alliance. I've done a ton of interviews and, and, and discussing that on the podcast. Marty, is, are you still the president these days of the boards? On, yeah. at NAIA. I, I am. So I needed something else to do with my yeah, free time. Yeah, exactly. What free time? So I think it's really important that we just pay attention, be aware, um, and and have information, right? We within the dog fancy should not be the ones saying, oh, I hate a bulldog or I hate a pug dog or I hate brachycephalic or we really, really, really <laughs> work together, support responsible breeders who are working hard to keep producing healthy, happy dogs. I think that that right. is one of our biggest failings, frankly. Right. So HSUS, ASPCA, all these organizations that try to get new legislation, they have the model figured out. They start with anti-pig um, farrowing crate legislation in a state that doesn't have pigs like New Jersey. Like how many pigs live in New Jersey? Not very many. But the legislation passed there to say farrowing crates are bad. And so now, in my opinion, farrowing crates are not a bad thing. A farrowing crate basically is a crate that a sow goes into so that when she has her baby pigs, she can't eat them and she can't lay on them. And sows are not nice creatures. Yeah. They lay on their pigs not on purpose, but they're like bull mastiffs and bulldogs and some of the other big bodied dogs. They don't know they're laying on a baby pig. And, and some of them are not nice to their little baby pigs and they'll hurt them. Mm -hmm. So they start with legislation in New Jersey because nobody has pigs in New Jersey. And then all of a sudden it's in New Jersey and then it's in New Hampshire and then it's in New York and then it's somewhere else. And then pretty soon it's in Iowa where mm -hmm. the pigs come from. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is how HSUS, ASPCA, PETA, all these organizations work. So if you want to support the kind of legislation that we need, Right now, Patty Strand and National Animal Interest Alliance is working really hard on bills to um, reduce the importation of animals mm -hmm. from outside the country. And that involves dogs, yes, because of brucellosis and rabies. That involves pigs because of African swine fever. That involves other species for other diseases. So be aware that you need to be legislatively active. And National Animal Interest Alliance has an website. You go on. 
You put in your legislator's information and you will get alerts from National Animal Interest Alliance when there's legislation pending at your state. But before this legislation, you need to get to know your local senators, your local representatives, the people in your state and the people at your national organization that they know you're a good guy. You're a dog breeder. You're an upstanding, responsible citizen that wants to have healthy animals. And you're a and subject you're matter citizen, expert. Exactly. And it doesn't matter if you think you're a subject matter expert, you are a subject matter expert because you are an animal person. And they will then turn to you and say, so what do you think of this legislation? So you're not calling them cold when there's something brewing and mm -hmm. terrible coming down the pipe. That's going to mean you can't have more than two dogs in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You need to know this stuff. You need to be in contact with these people ahead of time. So please. Get on NAIA, get the legislative alerts, pay attention, meet your legislative people, know their aides. The aides are the people that really make the decisions. Tomorrow, right. I'm meeting with Tammy Baldwin's aide about upcoming legislation. Nice. I'm doing this stuff. Not be yeah, it's really important. And yes. you guys need to be the subject matter experts. You're the good guys. You pay your taxes in that, that area. They know who you are. You're an upstanding, good citizen. They will call you when they need to know, but you can't wait until it's the last minute. It's amazing how fast some of this legislation gets passed, and you're going to get screwed right out of owning a dog, breeding a dog, eating meat if you choose to, wearing leather shoes if you choose to. We're going to lose those rights. Pretty soon it's all going to be something else if we're not paying attention. Yep. Absolutely. A hundred percent agree on that. So switching again, Marty, we had a question come in yeah. about um, do claws. How do you feel yeah. about whether one should or should not remove do claws? I will tell you this is on a hunting breed. Um, and I yeah. personally do because I've seen dogs with ripped do claws, but speak to us. And I still take them off. Um, I don't, think that they serve a real great function. So I know I'm going to conflict with Christine Zink, and there's a lot of things I think Christine is really right on, but on this, I'm going to take exception. I, I x-ray dogs. I look at limping dogs. I see dogs every day in my veterinary practice. I work six days a week. I have never seen a dog come in with a weak pasture and that I thought was caused by removing the dew claw. I have arguments about leaving dew claws versus removing them. I've heard people say it weakens the, the pasture and the carpus. I don't think that's true. I don't see dogs with arthritis in their carpus that are because dew claws are removed. Number two, I've heard people say if they fall through the ice, they're going to pull themselves out with a dew claw. I'm like, if you're falling through the ice and the dew claw is what's going to save you, uh, I'm having a hard time believing that. So, no, I don't think dew claws serve that purpose. Now, I think dew claws are annoying. I think they're unsightly in certain dogs. They certainly tear off when you're in the field. Um, for service dogs in particular, we've seen them stop taking them off of service dogs, and that makes me nuts because CCI dogs are supposed to put their feet in your lap and, and you know, on command right. and bring you their set of keys that you've dropped on the floor. And those duclas are nasty little creatures. I still take them off of my corgis because I'm allowed to. On my Danish Swedish farm dogs, I don't because I respect the Europeans, but... I don't think do claws serve a function, and I don't think removing them causes a health issue. So I think it depends on your breed. I remember 40 years ago, my first breeder client was a Dalmatian breed, and he came into me and he said, so if I leave these on, people are going to think I'm a bumpkin. I still remember him saying that to me 40 years later. Oh, my gosh, that's like funny. That's funny? That's funny. So it's appropriate in most breeds, certain great Pyrenees, you would not take them off. But in some breeds, I think it's important. Well, I, you know, I think that, for example, Akitas, Akitas and Shebas, they leave them on. Okay, okay. Right. Like they're not, they're not performing a function in which they run through heavy cover that gets snagged and rips them off. I mean, I've dealt with it. It's awful. It is. Um, okay. And the people that the people that tell you to, leave, to take them, to, the people that say leave them on, are the people that on Sunday afternoon when I'm at the clinic sewing them back up. Right. They're on their couch drinking a glass of wine. Right. So sure, it's easy for you to say because you're not the one in the trenches right. that are putting dogs back together. Exactly. Okay. Well, there you go. 
Um, anybody else out there in listener land? We've had sort of a, a little bit of a monologue. We'd love to have you join us in this conversation. Drop, drop a comment in the chat. Sawyer um, says that they leave them on in Laotian in case they're asked to export. So there's there's an interesting observation on that. <clears throat> And it goes to tails too. If you have a breed that has tails done in the U.S. but not in Europe, that makes it difficult. So when they're three days old, do you know who's going to look like what? I I'm not that good, but that's where your photo circling back. Right. Handy. Right. Well, and I mean, in certain things like you know, Stacy's Stacy Spinoni puppy that went winner's bitch at the national this year that we both picked at you know hours old as we're driving home from the C-section, just from her head. Right. So, I mean, sometimes, but not really. And, and I really, I really struggle with that. And I mean, for me personally, it would be a, um, an impediment to export, um, an actual dog to another country because I'm not going to not dock my breed. They are, they have their tails docked for a reason. So. Yeah. And most of the time your dogs are not going to be exported. I generally no. I mean, they have they have wire hair pointers in Germany, right? You know, German wire hair pointers. They don't need mine. <laughs> I mean, I they have them there. Yes. Um, okay. All right, you guys. I don't have any questions from anybody, so we're going to keep going on here on mentoring, and and just kind of shifting around a little bit. Um, I have found, and and Marty, you can speak to this as a veterinarian and as a dog breeder. I have found that my mentor was my mom, for example. Okay. She had a mentor who was a gal by the name of Jody Davidson. Those, those um, almost family stories, right? Uh, the, the, the tradition of, of what you do when you name a litter by a theme or, you know, whatever it is, I find that those carry down and can be sort of hard to wrap your head around changing them, right? So when we learn new information, we're like, no, it's always been done this way. Why would I do it? <laughs> right? So how do you think about that? Well, it, yeah, it is hard. It, it's like saying, well, why should you do this? Well, because I'm your mom. Right? <laughs> you have to do it this way because mom said so. <laughs> yeah, because we've always done it that way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So absolutely, I think there are places that we need to break with tradition, but I think we have to have good reason for it. So it does it does make it, it does make it tricky. Well, I just think of um, things that I've learned, you know, whelping and raising puppies. I, I one of the earliest podcasts we did here was a series of interviews with Dr. Gail Watkins, right on her Avidog system, and and some of the things that she incorporated in that system that completely, I mean, 110% changed how I raised puppies. And I, I, it was hard. I'm like, you mean, I don't need this heat lamp, you know, two feet over their heads. Wait, no, I'm not sure I can do this. Right. It is, it is hard. And I've been in touch with people over the years that are reluctant to do progesterone testing or reluctant to raise puppies a certain way. And you're absolutely uh, oops. But sometimes you have to let go and move into the 21st century. Yes, that can be a challenge. That can be a challenge. All right. <laughs> I, I, I mean, here I am talking to y'all on YouTube. Trust me, it's a challenge. <laughs> Trying to see me set this up. You could you could laugh. Um, and I was I was reminded as as Marty was talking about her spreadsheets for how many times she's done a C-section or what have you. It reminded me of those of us that show our dogs that have lists of their judges, their preferred judges or judges that they showed their dogs to that and what they saw. And today we have a horrible thing called the dog show judges report card that I can't stand. But when I was a little kid, I had a three ring binder. It was purple and green polka dotted, like giant polka dots. And in that three ring binder, I wrote down the name of every single dog or every single judge that I showed my dog to and what the results of the, of the judging were and who the competition was and what I thought they wanted and blah, blah, blah. 
I started doing that when I was like 13. So <laughs> I think that's another, wow. right. No, I'm definitely serious. That's another thing that I think we can kind of incorporate into our concept of keeping track of things, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Drink. Um, okay. Come on, y'all. There's, there's people out there. Listen, tell us a question. Ask us a question. Um, I'm going to ask someone to give me an idea. Jamie, what do you want to hear about? I know some of the people on the call, so I'm picking on them. Jamie, what do you want to hear about? Type something in here, honey. I'm not sure if this is actually on the same loop. Like the chat, like I don't know if it's behind. So um, I have, speaking of the idea of moving into the 20th, 21st century, Marty, you were talking earlier and you were talking about someone who didn't want to do a C-section on their dog. And I think this is a super interesting conversation because some of the old school anesthesias were difficult. And we've talked about this some on the podcast, but talk to us a little bit about why <laughs> in so many cases, a C-section is not the most horrible thing that could possibly happen to your dog. Yeah, that's a great question. And there's actually a strand going right now on the third age analogy list about post-op pain medication for C-sections. I think mm -hmm. that's really an important topic. So um, I graduated in 1981 and back in those days we had relatively short acting barbiturates, but we used a lot of barbiturate anesthesia, but for C-sections, we used a drug called Innovar Vet. Innovar Vet was a combination of fentanyl and droperidol. And the fentanyl, um, you could reverse. The droperidol, you could not. But it was a very effective drug for C-sections because you could reverse the droperidol or the fentanyl on the puppies. You could reverse it on the bitches. And the bitches would go home basically pretty alert and walking. Now, the downside to it was that if you made any loud noise during the anesthetic procedure, the dog would startle and stiffen on the table. So when I was doing some of these C-sections back when my kids were babies, we'd practically have to duct tape them to the chair and put duct tape across their mouths because I didn't have staff to manage the kids and the C-section and the puppies. So we had this kind of circus going on of kids and puppies and dog and no noise. So it was kind of a challenge. Um, over the years, we've certainly seen huge improvements in anesthesia, but even in the year 2000, Paula Moon, who was at the time a surgical anesthesiology resident at Cornell, did a fascinating study on 3,900 puppies wow. that were harvested from almost 800 C-section bitches. And she collected data from veterinarians all over the U.S. and Canada that were in private practice and at university settings. And we contributed data to that study. So I'm pretty familiar with the information. Basically, what she did is she didn't tell anybody what anesthetic agent to use. She just collected the data based on what did you use? Did you use pro uh, propofol and alfaxin didn't exist then? Did you use um, a short-acting barbiturate? What drug did you use? And she determined that puppy survival rates in 2000, so this was 22 years ago, before we had these newer drugs, were 5 to 6% higher across the board with C-section litters than were with vaginal birth. It was at zero hours, two hours, and seven days. So she didn't just look at it in the short term. She looked at it seven mm -hmm. days out, which, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's pretty good. If you get a puppy to seven days, you're probably going to get them to weaning and later. So I think her information was really important for us to realize that between 5 and 6% more puppies survived when they were born by C-section than by vaginal birth. Right. Is it nice for the bitch to have vaginal birth instead of a C-section? Yes. My worst thing is for a bitch to have to go through labor, deliver most of her puppies, and still end up with a C-section. Because then she has the C-section and the labor and the delivery. It yeah. sort of sucks. Yeah, that's but a bad one. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Yeah, sometimes you don't have a choice. She stalls out. She doesn't do well. Yesterday in my practice, I had a dog that came in. She was supposed to have nine puppies. She had eight at home. She stopped at one o'clock in the morning. 
at 10 o'clock in the morning, she was at my practice with a puppy left behind. The heart rate on the puppy was under 40. It was <gasps> horrible. Oh, my God. I mean, I looked at this heart rate on the ultrasound with Dr. Ahmed and went, <gasps> oh, my God. Okay, if you have any hope of saving this puppy, we need to go now. now. The client said go because, of course, she'd been up all night. So she was exhausted and she was still making decent decisions. So we threw the blood in the ultrasound or in the, in the machine, threw the dog off the ultrasound table, threw the EKG to the uh, cardiologist, threw in an IV catheter, ran to surgery, pumped her full of atropine and fluids. The puppy came out white as a sheet and revived beautifully. Oh, man. So. This puppy still survived in spite of the fact that all the odds were against him. It was a little boy. Mm. Um, so, yes, C-sections still have a higher percentage of survival rates. Is it hard on the bitch? It can be. But if you have a good surgeon who has good surgical technique, you use appropriate pain medication, local blocks, and post-op pain medication, which is the, the thread right now on the right. theriogenology list of what we should be using. Um, I have used non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for over 20 years on my postpartum C-section bitches. And I will tell you that those bitches make better mothers. They feel better. They lactate better. They nurse better. They feel better. They lay down better for their puppies. They're not grouchy with the puppies. These bitches do really well. Is do it you lovely to have vaginal birth? Absolutely. But you know what? It doesn't always work that way. No, it doesn't. I started, my family started in Clumber Spaniels. Trust me. I have, I <laughs> as a child participated in more C-sections than many breeders will ever encounter. C-sections do not yeah. scare me. This was back in the day when um, the anesthesia was terrible and our vet, I think I've told you this story before, um, Dr. Alan Ross at Companion Animal Clinic in Roseburg, Oregon, God love him, um, acquired the information, the knowledge, the skill, um, the recipe for how to do a C-section with morphine. And that's how all of our earliest clumber litters were C-sectioned. Yep. Was sort of crazy. <laughs> um, okay. So real quick, um, Ike is here and he has a question. He wants to know if I personally, I assume, am for all American dogs in order to get their owners into the sport of dogs. And I'm going to tell you what, Ike, my very, 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 very first dog in my life was a Beagle Dachshund Cocker Spaniel Asap, so Poodle. His name was Morris. He could sit up and beg. <laughs> no, no, he was not pure, but he was, he was in Heinz 57. And, and he could sit up and beg and he could put one ear up in the air. And my father was entirely convinced he could throw his farts. So there you go. <laughs> It's great. It's absolute um, um, ca uh, calling in life. And I love that dog more than life itself. And I have had many, many, many um, mixed breed dogs over the years. I had a, a, a sort of a shepherd lab Malamute kind of dog that when I was working at the animal shelter in Salt Lake City, I rescued him from there. I have zero problem with the average mutt dog. I think they're fabulous. I believe that everyone should get to choose the dog that they want, that fits their lifestyle the best. I happen to think that purebred dogs are easier for most people in America or anywhere in the world to, to own because they're predictable. We know what size, what color, what the hair, what the temperament, what the attitude, all those things. We know what they're going to be. Um, and that's why I like purebred dogs. But if someone has an all-American dog and wants to do obedience with it, and and I could very easily be thrown under a bus for this, but I believe if you have an all-American dog and want to do junior showmanship with it, you should get to do that. Um, yep. That Now, that is a super, super hot-button topic. Um, but it was a hot-button topic when they wanted to do all-American dogs and obedience, too, and now nobody even notices. So there you go. That that is my that is my opinion, uh, uh, Ike. And I just I think that the most important thing we need to remember is that we love all dogs. I do. I don't really care what it is. I happen to love my dogs the best because I am, like Marty said, much like my dogs. 
a little intense, a little, a little um, stand up and a few things like that. So there you go. Um, okay. So yeah, the predictability is huge. Yes. So when you go shopping for a car, you know, if you want a hot little sports car or a minivan, right? you know, you can't buy a hot sports car if you have eight crates you need to fit in it. So when you buy a car, you know what you're getting. When you buy a dog, you should know what you're getting. And I think when you're 30, you might be a little bit more flexible on, well, I bought a dog that I thought was going to, by the way, when you adopt a dog from a humane society, a rescue, you're whatever, buying you're it. Still buying it, right? Mm -hmm. So let's get real. Let's get the terms right. But say you get a dog from the shelter or wherever, and you're 30 years old, and the dog you thought was going to be 40 pounds turns into a 140 pound dog, you can probably still manage it. When you're 72 and you go to pick out your last dog and you think you're getting a 40 pound dog or a 12 pound dog or whatever, and it turns out to be five times you think the size you think it was going to be, or the coat isn't right, or the temperament, or the activity level, or the uh, defensiveness, or the you know possessiveness of that dog doesn't turn out to be what you right. expected it to be, it's pretty tough. I talk to clients all day long that when you get your next dog, you're 72, you're getting your last dog. When you're 80, you need to be able to get this dog in the car if something happens to it. Don't get a dog that weighs 140 pounds because when it blows a cruciate or blows its back or whatever, how are you going to manage can't. that? You, you can't. can't. You it's, can't. I, all day long, I have people that deal with that. I know. I have wanted an Irish wolfhound my entire life and I never had room for one. And now I have room for one. And I look at myself and I say, yeah, no, there's no way that I can do 250 pounds worth of it. I can't do it. I can't no, do it. That choice. That choice is I can't do it. Not at this point in my life. It's very depressing. I have to tell you. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. You guys, we have time for probably one more question. Um, Jamie's talking about, um, that she does breed education as her part to help with rescue um, so that you help res reduce rescue by educating people before they ever get the breed that they fell in love with. Um, and since Jamie has mastiffs, I think that's a really great idea, right? Like nobody should have a mastiff that doesn't understand what they actually are acquiring. Um, yep. Yeah. Yep. So yes. There's, there's a really nice book that, um, is out of print right now, but you can still buy it on Amazon. It's Daniel Tortora, The Right Dog for You. Oh, nice. First in it that, that go through activity and personality traits and shedding and indoor activity versus outdoor activity. It's a really nice, nice old book. You can yeah. still find it from time to time use. Um, but in the, the book I published last year, My Pandemic, right. Your Pandemic Puppy, right. it goes through some of these traits. So I encourage people to think through the traits that they want, make a list of the pros, the cons, the traits that are advisable for them, the traits that aren't important to them, and really make a good informed decision before they start to buy a puppy. So I encourage people to buy the Your Pandemic Puppy book before they get a puppy from you. So I'm going to tell you that the book is 20 bucks. Denise Flame published it. So if you have to buy a $20 book and give it to somebody and they decide not to buy a puppy from you because they read the book and they went, whoa, your breed is not right for me. Right. And that's the best $20 you'll ever spend instead of having that dog come back to you a year from now mm -hmm. ruined because mm -hmm. the wrong person got the wrong breed. Trust me. And, you know, I think the thing that's really frustrating and you understand this, Marty, you have you have the same kind of minds of dogs you know you talk to people you ask them they answer they say all the right things you talk to them some more you tell them and they say yeah 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 and then at a year old or a year and a half old the dog's been sitting in a kennel run for nine months trust me i've got one here at my house because it was too much dog and it took them nine months to own up to it and call you and say so i mean i'm glad they called and didn't dump her but it's very frustrating it's very frustrating it is. And so the more of that you can avoid, the better. So educate your people is absolutely yep. correct. Um, and having them go somewhere else to buy a puppy might be the best thing that ever happened to you. Yes, absolutely. And like, like Jamie says, you know, there's a right dog for everyone, but not 
but dogs are not the, even a Labrador is not the right dog for everyone. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that yeah. that yeah. is to me, the beauty of purebred dogs. It, they are history. They are arch. They, they are all of these things, but they are so specific and they give us that opportunity to, to have exactly what it is we want. And a wire hair pointer and a, and a Spinoni Italiano are both bearded, wire-coated hunting dogs from Europe. And they could be no more different than if they were from different planets. Okay. <laughs> and I think that that is absolutely essential because a wire hair pointer is a perfect fit for me. And a Spinoni Italiano is a perfect fit for my friend. It, right? Like you can't get that with your average, I don't know what it is. It came from the street. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So purebred dogs, whoop, whoop, all dogs, the best, whatever you got, we are always happy to have dog lovers here. And I just wanted to give a particular shout out, Bethany is here all the way from Australia. So I don't even know what time it is there. I'm a little terrified to think about that. But Bethany, you win the prize for the, for the longest no distance kidding. distance listener. Uh, Bethany says she has a whippet, but she'd love a greyhound, but they're so much bigger. Yes, indeed they are. Yep. Um, but they don't break. They don't break as easily as a whippet either. Well, actually, I don't, I don't know. Are your whippets out there breakable? The whippets I've had around me haven't been breakable. IGs, yes. The, but The Iggy's are. Yeah, for sure the Iggy's are. I always thought a whippet was going to be breakable. But, I, I mean, I've had several here over the years. And I didn't find them to be all that fragile. Like, you know, I can remember looking at them before I was actually owned them or lived with them or what have you and thinking, my God, you can see through their skin, you know, like that. But they're they're a lot tougher than they look. Yeah. Yeah. Hounds are tough dogs. Yes, absolutely. Tough minded. And and they look so, you know, the whippets particularly, I just I get a chuckle out of it. They look so, you know, beautiful and elegant and they're resting gently and they make this perfect little thing on your couch and then you let them loose and they're like, Wah! <laughs> They are. They're just crazy. Hey, Heather's here too. Yes. Yeah. Heather Butcher. Heather has, yep. Heather's been having a rough time. So Heather props to you. I'm super glad you made it. And it's 1230 PM. Is that afternoon, Bethany or 1230 PM? Like 1230 in the morning. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Well, you guys, we are about at the end of our rope. Uh, Marty, thank you so much for joining us. You and I were laughing the other day because we had different things planned and we got to talk to each other three days in a row. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, for sure. It was perfect. For sure. You've now had your Laura quota for a full month. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> anyway. Well, I'll, be, I'll get over it. I'll get over okay. it. Okay. All right. Shoo. Super glad about that. <laughs> You guys, thanks everyone for joining us. Pure Dog Talks Lightning Round with Laura, our live podcast for your friends who didn't get to catch it. I will be posting the link to this YouTube video onto the Pure Dog Talk Facebook page. So you'll be able to find it there. And um, thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us. This is a lot of fun. I'm really, I have been wanting to do this for a, a couple of years and got distracted with some other stuff. And I think this is fabulous. So thanks everyone for joining us. And remember, it's going to be the first Tuesday of every month. All right. So let's look here. I'll give you, I'll give you a pre, oh, March 1st. Imagine that. So on March 1st, we will be back here and we'll have another topic and another special guest. So thanks everybody. Don't forget, thank our sponsors, Embark and True Panion, and we'll catch you on the flip side. All right, y'all. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Marty. <laughs> <laughs>